Well, good afternoon on this first Friday of January of 2023. Welcome to SADS Foundation Live. I'm Mike Ackerman, genetic cardiologist at Mayo Clinic and director of Mayo Clinic's Winland Smith Rice Genetic Heart Rhythm Clinic and its Winland Smith Rice Sudden Death Genomics Laboratory. But as I've done on most Fridays since February of 2020, I come to you on behalf of Alice Laura, our CEO of the SADS Foundation, Sudden Arrhythmia Death Syndrome Foundation. As many of you know, we are the nonprofit advocacy organization for you, for families at risk of sudden cardiac arrest, sudden cardiac death from genetic heart conditions like genetic heart electrical conditions of long QT syndrome or Brigada syndrome or genetic heart muscle conditions like arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And it's a new year and the new year got off to a really wow and fortunately not tragic start from the standpoint of sudden cardiac arrest. Sudden cardiac arrest for all of us has been in the news in, in, a, in a different uh, way for these past uh, four days. What am I talking about? Well, of course, unless you haven't uh, been paying attention, we're referring to Monday night football for the NFL and the uh, witness collapse and cardiac arrest seen by millions of a wonderful person, Mr. DeMar Hamlin of the Buffalo Bills. During a normal tackle, a normal collision, an ordinary uh, collision from uh, Cincinnati Bengals. And in very short order over these past four to five days, we've seen what I've called the good, the bad, and the very ugly. I witnessed it like many of you, and I was sitting in bed. And in fact, one of my sons was with me. And even after it happened, he, uh, did the doctor diagnosis that some of us saw in the Twitterverse, uh, the social media verse within minutes. And hey, Dad, do you think it's that collision thing, that commodio cortis thing? And my first reaction was no, not. Or if it was, we don't come to that verdict until about two weeks uh, from now. But what instead did we see happen? We saw within minutes of the collision and the collapse a YouTube video posted about Commodio Cortis. Ridiculous and irresponsible uh, it was that set off unintended consequences that I warned about. And in fact, soon thereafter, that warning of what can happen if you come to a premature verdict of guilty as charged with a specific entity or a reason why, what could happen? Shortly thereafter, my friends and colleagues from the American College of Cardiology, led by Dr. Jonathan Kim and Dr. Baggish and Dr. Martinez, they put out a very important statement from the Sports Cardiology Council, essentially reiterating the same, that it was reckless and irresponsible to declare the cause uh, that quickly. Because what could happen? Well, the, what can happen is, as many of you families know, where you've been part of a sudden cardiac arrest evaluation following your family's close call or potentially your family's tragic completion of not just SCA, sudden cardiac arrest, but SCD, sudden cardiac death, is you can put blinders on, meaning you can get locked and fixed with your conclusion as to the why, and then you stop searching as carefully for the truth. And that is something I see regularly. And some who comment and say, well, that doesn't happen are actually clueless. They don't realize the reality of what can happen with a premature conclusion of the cause, the why. And why did I say that is because that entity of Commodio Cortis is an entity where we back into it after ruling out everything else, not where we start with. Now, sometimes we may be more suspicious when we see a perfectly normal, normal host compact injury right there over the heart in a martial art or from a baseball or a hockey puck or a lacrosse uh, ball, sometimes a, a, a soccer ball. And then right with that impact of that missile colliding force, collapse and down. 
much more index of suspicion there, not from an ordinary tackle that we see hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of times dispersed across the shoulder pads. The physics and the mechanism just wasn't right to blame it on the impact. Why was that important also? Well, the ugly. Have you seen, I've seen, that there's been put out death threats on the wonderful gentleman from the Cincinnati Bengals who made the tackle or who is part of the collision, Mr. T. Higgins, as if he caused it. Crazy, nonsense, wrong. Stop it. And that's what can happen if you say the reason why was the collision. Now, when and thankfully we have good news, we have great news as part of the story. Mr. DeMar Hamlin is recovering, as you and I have heard from the press releases and from the press conferences, neurologic recovery, the noggin looks good, breathing tube apparently removed, asked right away, did we win? So there's, uh, uh, we can breathe a sigh of relief for him of that it looks like we're gonna have a good story, a heroic story of recovery. Why? In part, the why is athletic trainer, Denny Kellington, who he and the team, when they noticed something was amiss, that this wasn't just somebody falling to the ground, but things weren't right, activated the chain of survival promptly and effectively, calling, pushing, shocking, meaning 911, push, effective CPR, deep and fast, and until first responders and, and order was restored. A lot of heroes in that, starting with Denny and the team, and then many millions of us heroes with the power of prayer, not generic prayer, but prayer as you saw from on ESPN of the sportscaster or the commentator praying live on TV. I think uh, Orlowski uh, is the gentleman's name seen a lot of wonderful things happen after the fact, awareness increasing and getting the focus put on the right perspective of rapid response saves lives. CPR saves lives, which has been something that we at SADS Foundation have been saying for years and have been helping schools get equipped, making sure that schools are safe working with the school nurses, uh, working with communities. Not is it not just a sad, safe school, but is it, is it a sad, safe community? Meaning, is there emergency preparedness and readiness to where it would be difficult to have a witness collapse, a witness sudden cardiac arrest for you to be able to die suddenly in that community? And there's communities throughout the country and the world where it's difficult to die suddenly. And ours is one of them, Rochester, Minnesota. Some may say we don't have much going for us in this town in the middle of nowhere. We do, but one of the things we have going for us is it's hard to die suddenly in Rochester, Minnesota. Why? Because of visionaries like Dr. Roger White and others who long ago now, decades ago, established readiness among all first responders so that there was an external defibrillator, the ability to shock, which isn't this anymore, it's push the button, to be in every squad car, every police car, every ambulance, every fire truck, to have the schools under leadership of my former chief of pediatric cardiology, Dr. Frank Seta, to have all of our schools equipped with an automatic external defibrillator. And so the conversation is happening across the, the, the globe now of how is our readiness in our community? And importantly, not just for the athlete. That witnessed event that we all saw on the field in Cincinnati four days ago, that happens probably 10 times a day in young people age one to 35, whether they're young and healthy and athletic like him, or whether they're young, healthy and an artist, or whether they're young, healthy and an academic, and that collapse 10 times a day, 
may have nothing to do with sport or recreation or activity. It may be walking to the school bus, maybe brushing teeth. It may be any setting of life. And so while the, the society seems gripped with the awfulness of what we witnessed, and it was emotionally gripping for sure, let's not lose sight that that's not a once ever occurrence. This is a daily occurrence, 10 times a day occurrence in the United States of America. And if we react from it, and put our focus away from commodio cordis, bam, that mechanism to if somebody collapses in our community, suddenly, unexpectedly witnessed, how quick is that chain reaction of survival? How quick will we recognize that something's wrong? Activate the call 911. Begin the push, rapid hands-only compression CPR, rapid 100 times a minute, deep two inches plus. And the moment the decision is made to push, that we're also retrieving the electricity. The call for the automatic external defibrillator, the AED, for which many of you are familiar with. In fact, many of you probably have one as part of your own family's safety gear. And we've had uh, wonderful companies that help us equip our families with AEDs that we partner with, and we're grateful for them. But what, what's that chain reaction like in your community, in your school, whether it's for an attendee of the school or a grandparent coming to watch that school play or for a sport event, but not worried about the middle schooler, but maybe about the 64-year-old umpire referee running up and down the court. What would be our readiness for that? And we at SADS Foundation, we are here to help uh, uh, partner in that and increase the emergency preparedness of Americana of the world with that safety plan. In fact, we have a school nurse forum coming next week, January 11th, 7 p.m. Eastern, to uh, discuss this further, to help with the sad, safe school uh, process. And, and so that's the good, the very good that can come out of this increased awareness. So grateful for his recovery that looks good. Like many of you, I too am praying for uh, this gentleman and, and we'll be excited to see him return. I've seen it said that, well, when he comes back, his career is over. Not so fast. Many of you are, are know that that's the wrong answer put out in there. More fake news because many of you are part of our number of families that when evaluated and diagnosed and identified and treated, you can stay in the game of life. And you can stay in the game of life at all levels. For those who are athletes, it may be little league ball. It could be Olympic ball. One of my patients is has a silver medal from Olympic baseball from the past summer Olympics. It may be professional ball like the NBA, the NHL, and so forth. So let's not be too quick to conclude that for this particular survivor, that his career is over. He's under careful evaluation. And once they conclude the why, and what does that look like uh, for the sudden cardiac arrest survivors? You know what it looks like, don't you? You've experienced it. You've either experienced that there's been a careful, methodical, detective-like investigation with pit bull tenacity, as I describe it to our trainees, where you turn over every stone and you're looking at every clue and you're sizing up all of the data, all of the information, all of the observations to come to the why. And there's a law, if that's done carefully, there's a long list 
of suspects that you have to rule out and you do the various tests. Uh, some tests are fancy. Some tests are simple, like asking questions. For that sudden cardiac arrest survivor, whoever he or she is, was that the first event? Were there previous warning symptoms? We put out the SADS warning signs, haven't we? Have you ever fainted suddenly, unexpectedly, without warning, during exertion, excitement, activity, where you had almost no warning and down you went? But then 10 seconds later, you woke back up. That's not, possibly not, a normal woozy, lightheaded spell that might have been a warning spell for the presence of an SCA associated condition like long QT syndrome as an example. Are you related, not only your story, but your family story? Are you related, was he, is he, is she related to somebody in the family structure who's died suddenly or unexpectedly before the age of 40, who had an unexplained car accident where that didn't make sense? where there was an unexplained drowning and alcohol and boating collision had nothing to do with it. Where you're related to a sibling, cousin, niece, nephew, uncle, where they have been actually labeled as having a genetic heart condition, long QT, CPVT, Brugada. What's the story? So we, we are a detective and we ask those clues. And I know, and given the people on his team that those questions are being asked. And then we do tests and see what does the heart look like electrically, structurally, functionally, and see are there any clues that maybe there was susceptibility, vulnerability, fragility present, such that in that particular host, an otherwise ordinary strike collision would upset the apple cart, trip the heart into the potentially dangerous, life-threatening rhythm of ventricular fibrillation, heading them into sudden cardiac arrest, for which if we don't call, push, shock, and restore order, we could end up with the tragedy of sudden cardiac death. And so, that detective work is ongoing and then there may or may not be findings that point somebody to the possibility of a genetic substrate for which we then do genetic testing and we get the result back in 10 to 20 days and then after that if there's nothing 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 of vulnerability, susceptibility, fragility, then you could back into the conclusion of it was only the freak accident of Commodio Cordis, where in that host, that collision on that time was enough. So I'm skeptical because it just shouldn't happen in that sport with that kind of ordinary tackle unless there was some vulnerability. And we'll find out. Like you, I want to know, I'm curious. Like you, uh, I would be more than happy to help uh, with this uh, process uh, in any way. But in the meantime, we have to stop the ugly. Mr. Higgins did not cause that cardiac arrest. And so people should leave him alone as he recovers from his own trauma. Many of you are traumatized and I get it. And we in fact had a support group yesterday for the SADS Foundation for those where it struck a chord and maybe triggered some post-traumatic stress. And we're here for you at the SADS Foundation. In fact, we're gonna do another SADS Connection support group. Mark it down next week, November 8th or November, January 18 at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. And join that 
we have so many things uh, that, again, in, in spite of what could have been awful, we can be grateful and thankful and optimistic that that close call has triggered a catalytic reaction that may save lives of countless people throughout the world, young and old, from sudden cardiac arrest by increasing our response time, by making it harder in your community where you live to have a witness collapse that culminates in tragedy of sudden death versus a witness collapse that triggers a prompt 911 call in the US, push, rapid chest compressions, shock, where's that AED? Oh, it's there, it's in the public square because we create a sudden death safety net in your community where it becomes very difficult to die suddenly. We've called for, and I've called for, wouldn't it be incredible if as a middle school or a high school graduation requirement, we have training for effective hands-only chest compression CPR. And we have thousands and thousands and thousands of immediate first responders who could see that witness and begin and do what Denny Kellington did for that specific player for which we see so many people do. In fact, you know, I had a wonderful person, Lady Glockenflecken on, where she was the one who did effective chest compression CPR for her husband and helped save his life. And many of you have shared uh, your story. I shared with you how one of my patients, where I tell my families, who have their safety drill and their AED, that their piece of safety equipment will likely never get used on their patient, their child, because we know what they have and we have treated it and we have short-circuited the threat, but they may use it on somebody else. And you know the story now where that somebody else happened, where the, my patient's family ran to get their AED out because their child didn't go down during the soccer game, but the referee did. The And they were able to bring that gentleman back pronto and completely with a wonderful, complete recovery. So that's the good. Focus on the good and the opportunity to take what could have been awful for him and his family, now a close call with what looks like a wonderful recovery on, on, uh, on the way, to have all of us be asking the question of, is my community sad safe? Could I be that ambassador for my community to make it safer, to make it harder to die suddenly in it during a witness collapse? And we at the SADS Foundation, we're here to help you every step of the way. We have tools and resources. Check it out at www.sads.org, S-A-D-S.org. Or if you prefer, www.stopsads.org. Because that's what we are doing at the SADS Foundation. We're stopping it. We're living and we're thriving. And I know many of you are very troubled and upset and triggered as I see in the uh, what Colleen is sharing, but like over there, faith over fear. We live and we thrive because we, we almost, almost always short circuit the problem when we know it's there and not just short circuit it and prevent the tragedy of sudden death. We enable you and your family to live large, to pursue and experience the abundant life. So I'm mindful, like many of you are, about the events of the last four days. We at SADS are available. I'm at available. We're, we just recorded yesterday a Mayo Clinic cardiology podcast about sudden cardiac arrest in the young. And that'll come out early next week. Look for it. Share it. And uh, we are all uh, in this together. And I continue, Damar, and your family praying for you, uh, not ge generically, but for me 
praying for you in the name of Jesus Christ for your complete healing and your full recovery of mind, body, and soul. Well, that was a longer monologue, wasn't it, of our introduction where we're set up for questions and answers for the balance of our time uh, together. So let me see what's coming on in on the sidebar. And let's begin. And when you see this, if you thought that that conversation or monologue that we just did would be helpful, send it around. I think there's some things for a lot of us to chew on and learn from uh, with the good, the bad, and the ugly. Linda, you get the first one now of the of the year, the first one of 2023. And I'm going to go try to do speed dial with my counter left at 10 minutes. So Linda sharing 15 year old daughter with LQT5 on a good dose of Nadalol, never a symptom. I love this so far. Needs to have her wisdom teeth extracted. Is it safe to do in the office or the hospital? What do you look for? Oh, that's a common question. It's a really good one to start the year. And again, in, it, for me and for most of us at the SADS Foundation, if it's a really low risk person, as you're describing, we do the standard drill wisdom teeth extraction in the outpatient setting, making the, the team aware, ideally in the setting where they would say, yeah, we do have an automatic external defibrillator for the heaven forbid worst case unlikely scenario. And if there is anybody who's worried, concerned, unsettled or higher risk, uh, or has a lot of vomiting, nausea, tendency, we might do it in the hospital setting, but the vast majority of our patients do their wisdom teeth extraction, just like any of their friends uh, in their class who does not have a SADS uh, condition. And a hello to Israd and Marissa uh, and Andrew. Thanks for your second question of the new year. Uh, as a person with Brugada syndrome without a defibrillator and a Bengals fan, a uh, very trigger. Oh, I'm sorry. So no question, but triggering as it may be, fear generating, I'm sur sure, but we choose victory over the paralysis of fear. Fear paralysis serves no useful purpose. Julie's wondering, why did he need breathing support? Uh, pretty common after a sudden cardiac arrest for any individual who is down and down for a while, and there were minutes of chest compressions uh, performed that there is a necessity to help the, the system, including intubating the person, providing breathing support, for which, like I shared at the beginning, I learned like many of you, the, the announcement from the medical team of the breathing tube uh, being re removed uh, uh, last night. So that is pretty typical uh, for that to be necessary. Now, of course, if a long QT or CPVT or a Brigada patient had a very brief self-limiting faint because the danger rhythm lasted only 10, 15 seconds, well, then they're not gonna need anything of anything uh, because it didn't cascade to the level of concern. Um, yeah, and for Cheryl, um, she experienced her own five-year-old uh, collapsing in front of her. Um, and then Cheryl is asking, what do I think it was? And I think we covered that. I think from my standpoint, it's to be determined. There either was a pre-existing vulnerability that they will, the team will figure out either in the heart's electrical system, the muscle system, the coronary artery system. I guess it could not even be the heart at all, but I doubt it. I bet the heart is the root cause from what we've seen. So there's either a pre-existing vulnerability that enabled the adrenaline rush of that experience to culminate into the sudden cardiac arrest. I suppose that one could keep commodial cortis on the list, but like I shared with you, that's what I would come to even watching the collision and saying, oh yeah, there was a contact there. I would not declare that mechanism and that entity, which is super rare. 
uh, the reason until about, oh, two to three weeks from now. And, and this is so important as we emphasize so that we do this deliberately and we don't have these incorrect conclusions of, I heard somebody say, uh, and somebody apparently who is a leader say, NFL is getting too dangerous. No, it's no, their danger level has been the same for a long, long time. It's a dangerous collision sport for ankles, knees, heads, a lot of body parts for which I suppose even this collision blow mechanism. But like I said, that collision blow mechanism of commodial cord is super rare in football. So people don't need to be wondering whether we're going to see another tackle next week or this weekend cause a similar thing. So I'm waiting to hear and see the evidence if, or, or be involved. Uh, if that if the need is there before I make the conclusion as to the why, just hopefully the point of the need for us to be far more careful and uh, responsible. Yep, Cheryl, CPR saves lives. Um, and I'm so glad it's true for your son as well. A long question from Luis from Portugal, but greetings from Portugal. And I'm just glancing to see. Uh, I don't see a question, so I'm sorry, Luis. Uh, I'll, I'll scroll down. Um, what is the best? Jill's asking, what is the best hospital for LVNC? Well, those are four letters that we don't talk about very much in that order of LVNC, left ventricle non-compaction cardiomyopathy. That's a different cardiomyopathy from some of the others we've spoken of, different from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And uh, it's also one of those entities where the there's a challenge in making sure we're dealing with true disease, heart muscle disease of LVNC versus having imaging modalities that have gotten so good and so sensitive that they see what we call prominent trabeculations in the LV pump, the left ventricle. There are lots of good places throughout, uh, if, if you are in the United States, of course, we would be more than delighted uh, to evaluate that condition as we see a lot where there's a debate, is that or is that not a true condition in that, in that person? Uh, Brit, Britain or Britain, hi there tested positive for RYR2 gene. My daughter has CPVT and has had multiple sudden cardiac arrest. Uh, has a defibrillator, had the denervation surgery. What is my next step after testing positive? Well, great question. First, you've done the right thing, which means when a family member is found to have the root cause, the genetic label, all appropriate relatives, all, appropriate relatives need to undergo variant specific genetic testing like you did. And why do I say that? Because just this year, this week of this year, I had two primary care providers tell families of mine that there was no need to do the variant testing because the quote echo was normal, quote ECG was normal, Ain't bad advice, wrong advice. When it's found in the family, you must do the variant specific testing to see who did and who did not inherit the genetic marker. And those who did not can potentially get dismissed forever. Those who tested positive like you did now need to get carefully evaluated to ask the next question, which is, yes, I own the marker, but how is it showing itself in my body right now. And so even though your daughter has experienced sudden cardiac arrest and is pretty impressive in her body, it may not be in yours. It may be a dud in your body. So the doctors and you 
need to do a careful risk assessment with all of the standard cardiac tests to look at the now what. Now, how is it showing itself? And again, we see, don't forget, January 11th and the school nurse uh, forum. And uh, hi, Victoria. Happy New Year. Um, describing a collapse at a grocery store with the AED and the employee did great. That's good. Um, I'll just continue on. And thanks to, oh, I appreciate the comment from the Canadian SADS Foundation. And with, even without your comment and compliment, guess what? You are going to be announced because I'm so excited about an upcoming new adventure from the Canadian SADS Foundation and a dear friend of mine, Dr. Shu Sanatani, who is going to be the up north A eh, equivalent of yours truly as we have our Canadian SADS Foundation uh, chapter, their version of live start in not too long, 18 days, January, mark your calendars, January 24, Tuesday, noon Eastern, where Dr. Shu Sanatani and the founder of the Canadian SADS Foundation, a dear person, Pam Husband, will be launching. And I'm really excited because I get to join Shu for their February edition. And so I wish them all the best. Uh, we have a wonderful partnership and uh, it's gonna be exciting to see what they add uh, to increasing the word, increasing the education. And as we have been and will continue to do, save lives together. And for those who get diagnosed, evaluated, treat, treated, to enable them to live and thrive whether they're on this side of the Canadian border or that side of the Canadian border. So all the best, uh, Dr. Sanatani, and have a, a great, great weekend. Um, let's see, we're at two minutes on the counter and I'm scrolling through, I see a lot of statements appropriately. So, uh, um, and maybe we'll finish with this one. And so Cheryl, you get the final one. And I don't know if you already got two for this year, uh, but if you did, that's bonus. And she's asking, what would be my drug of choice for ADHD in a CPVT six-year-old? My kid is really struggling. And what we, we don't, my cardiologist doesn't know what to give. Oh, that's a good question. And we talked of it in the past. We need to talk about it more. And there is first, ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADD, Attention Deficit Disorder, is present or diagnosed in about 7 to 10% of elementary school kids. And that amount, 7 to 10%, is the same, more or less, in my long QT kids, my CPVT kids, my ACM kids, meaning there's really been nothing that we've seen about their disease process that's increased the frequency of ADD. Now, as you know, in the past, there is a increased signal of some levels of learning disabilities in CPVT, about 10% uh, for more uh, cognitive disabilities. But for ADHD, ADD, we get to have, if you will, seven to 10 percent of our patients have the same uh, issue as seven to 10 percent of all six-year-olds. What hasn't happened is we seem to have chosen a path of insisting that we will not treat your child's ADHD because we fear the ADHD treatment will trigger the CPVT. Not true. The evidence for that triggering mechanism is very, very weak. So weak that we need to make a better risk-benefit deliberation and having children failing and flunking and having significant mental health issues from not being able to attend and be attentive and to focus and to do doesn't seem like a good trade out of a 
uh, out of an unrealistic fear that that therapy would be dangerous. Second, the cardiologist should not be the one to know what to use. It really is a matter of partnering with your behavioral specialist for them to say, given how that ADHD is showing itself in the family, I think this medication would serve the best. And then just reviewing it with our cardiologist, the cardiologist uh, as a double check. But I basically have no fear of ADHD associated stimulant therapy. Now, having said that, we don't start with drugs for that condition. And I'm sure you know that. And there's certainly probably a significant overuse of going too quickly to medications, pills, stimulants, as opposed to some of the non pharmacologic strategies. Having said that, when you need to go to that medication to help your child succeed, uh, dramatic success stories, beautiful success stories that we've seen of kids with CPVT, long QT, and ADHD previously failing in school, now thriving in school. More to unpack there. Well, that was a lot for our first episode of the new year, our 109th episode since the beginning. And I can't wait to be back with you two weeks from today where I'll be joined by the chief medical officer, Dr. Philip Sager from Thrive Therapeutics and some other of his colleagues to discuss what does it look like uh, to go from identifying a new idea, a new compound, uh, a new potential class of therapy to then doing the experiments to uh, improve that verdict or end it, and then start the clinical trial. And then how long might it take from that clinical trial, if successful, to result in a new FDA approved medication where its purpose is for the treatment of long QT syndrome? If that, is, if that happens for Thrive Therapeutics and their new drug and strategy, it would be the first FDA approved drug where the indication is specifically for long QT syndrome. Exciting, lot to do, lots to do. And we'll unpack that and show you what is the realistic uh, landscape during that journey from early phase science discovery to translation to to uh, clinical design trial and testing phase one two and three to submission to perhaps ultimate approval and availability of a new treatment for long qt syndrome there'll be just the first of many news news in our field it's an exciting time for the families and for us as we do this journey together so until two weeks from now be well be safe live large faith over fear in and in our new year of 2023 blessings to all of you